Welcome back, folks, to the ninth episode of Behind the Brand. Thank you so much for tuning in. We are very honored to have you. My name is Anna Hendricks, and I'm the CEO of Arch Digital Agency, a full-service social media marketing agency specializing in the health and wellness industries. You can find out more about us at archdigitalagency.com. My name is... <laughs> um, I'll just read that again and again. <laughs> In addition to managing an agency, one of my greatest loves in life is the personal story. From growing up watching actors' studios to my love of memoirs, biographies, and nonfiction books, the personal story has become an obsession. I'm so inspired by the stories of normal people who did something extraordinary. But what fascinates me the most isn't the pinnacle, but the climb. On B2B, we get to know people who have managed to take a typical life and turn it into a spectacular one. We'll be discussing the trials and successes, the quirks that make them who they are, and how they continue to grow as individuals. Today, we're discussing how a food writer is educating the world about celiac disease. But first, I want to introduce my co-host and amazing community manager, KP Kelly, who is a branding consultant and a Twitter marketing specialist at Arch. Thank you so much for all you do, KP. You are welcome. <laughs> And now I'm pleased to introduce, I'm just going to screw everything up today. <laughs> now I'm pleased to introduce my eighth guest in this series, Ms. Jody Ettenberg. Jody is a writer, photographer, and public speaker exploring the world full-time since April 2008. Her website, Legal Nomads, tells the stories of places she visits, often through food. She is also the author of the Food Traveler's Handbook and recently won a Lowell Thomas Award for Best Travel Blog and three American Travel Journalism Awards for her writing and photography. She has been featured in the New York Times, National Geographic, BBC Travel, and more. Prior to founding Legal Nomads, Jody worked as a lawyer in New York for fifth for five years. <laughs> I am 1,000 years old. No. Five years. <laughs> Five years. Five years. Thank you so much for being here, Jody. I'm so I'm so happy to have you on the show. My pleasure. Uh, this this is the church that I was telling you. It actually bongs 37 times, so hopefully it'll not oh, wow. distract too much of the recording. Uh, at no Strange, it is my pleasure to be here and uh, nice to see you virtually. But it was great to meet you in person in Vietnam as well. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so before we jump into the show, we're actually going to do the segment called Audience Asks. And uh, this is where folks share a question and all of us get one minute to answer it. So for folks who are in the audience, feel free to throw in a random question. I'm going to get my timer ready. And if we don't have a question, then I'm going to use mine. <laughs> this should be you fun. You made it sound like a threat. Like I'm gonna I know. Use, and it's gonna be a tough <laughs> question. Let me tell you. Well, I realize that KP will actually have an issue with this question if we don't have one. Is this <laughs> like if your shoe, what type of shoe would you be? Yeah. If yep. you could come back in your next life as a vegetable. Oh good, we got a great one here from Shannon. Love it. Let's grab right. it. Let's grab it. Let's not talk politics tonight. I feel like there's a bad Nick, oh, the answer okay. is yes. Okay, coming from Miss Shannon, what animal do you love the most and why? Jody, one minute, go for it. Uh, the, my favorite animal in the world is a tarsier. Uh, it's found in the Philippines, it's endangered. I actually went to the Philippines just so I could see it my, uh, firsthand. Um, it, I love it because it's a tiny lemur and its eyes are fixed into its head, but it's nocturnal. And so because its eyes are fixed, its head turns all the way around in a circle. And I, I saw it in National Geographic when I was a kid and decided like I really wanted to go there. And um, I actually got to the Philippines in 2009 event, in the end um, to see them. They're very weird, alien-like looking animals, but I love them. <laughs> I have actually, yeah, I've seen them before online and they're adorable. They are, they're wonderful. They, um, they jump incredible lengths like their their latin name involves like their bones and their ankles how far they can jump so it was very cool to see one i have a great photo of my brother who's uh, also a giant kp and his giant head behind like this little tarsier and the tarsier's in focus and his head's just kind of like looming in the background that's wonderful <laughs> there's my minute wow one. kp kp's always like 
hitting that yeah. timer. Look, you've got you've got competition. Yeah, <laughs> fill up a minute. My favorite animal. So am I on the clock now? Wait, wait. Okay, here we go. What animal do you love the most, KP? That's another one, but I don't have like a go-to answer. Um, I think most of the time, though, it's a gorilla. I think because I too can relate to being like 500 pounds and having really long arms and really enjoying a quality banana or two. Um, so I think gorillas I relate to the most. They seem like us. Their expressions seem a lot like us. Um, I used to like dolphins quite a bit. I went swimming with the dolphins before, but that's very scary because I'm not very good at telling the difference between a dolphin and a shark fin. So that was really a scary experience. Um, they don't have <laughs> swimming with the gorillas though. So I had to go with dolphins, but for this answer, I'll go with gorilla. That's fair. <laughs> I feel like that was the entertainment answer. <laughs> but true, gorilla. But true. Okay, uh, one minute. So my favorite animal is a horse. And I think it'll always be a horse. I'm a Sagittarius, half woman, half horse. I don't know what it is about horses. I've just always loved them. I think they're beautiful and graceful and strong. And, and I love the fact that they react to kind of the energy that's around them. I just think that they're an incredible, incredible animal. So I know it's kind of boring, but I, I intend on having a horse one day, even if it's like it's someone else's whatever. Like, I love horses. Okay, yeah, that was my answer. We definitely both have better answers than you, Anna. I think we can all agree <laughs> on that. Wow. Whatever. <laughs> okay, so. KP, please take care of that. I'm fine. <laughs> He's uh, okay. it's not a troll, but. That's interesting. Okay, so let's grab one more question. Let's grab this one from Cheval. So one more one minute question. And thanks y'all for the extra. We will definitely get into, uh, get into these other questions. So make sure and stick around. Okay, Jody, you go first. What is your favorite country to travel to? Oh, you know the answer to that one, I'm sure. <laughs> Uh, my favorite country is definitely Vietnam, um, mostly because of how much I love food. And, and as a celiac, a lot of the food there is stuff that I can eat also. Um, I spent a lot of time there in the last few years. But before I got to Vietnam, which was only recently um, compared to the length of my travels, I would have said the two other choices were uh, Mongolia, which was an incredible experience. I spent a month there, uh, time with nomads in the desert, and took the trains across uh, to China and also Bolivia, which I found a really interesting and obviously a sad history, but a really interesting place to visit. Bolivia. <laughs> okay, that was really quick, actually. Um, I speak fast. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 it's fine, it's fine. <laughs> it's a huge question, right? Like people ask me that, and I'm just like, what? Um, it's a hard okay. question, because honestly, I feel like you know, every country has great things and things that are difficult. And it's just a matter of like what jives best with where your mental state is then. And then of course the places that you're not, you know, really feeling passionate about, if you go back to them another time, it's sure chance that you may change your opinion, you know? Totally. Deserves another shot. Yeah, I, I mean, I've, you know, I've traveled to South America several times, Central America, and it seems like every time I go back, especially to Costa Rica, it's it's a, a different experience, a different feel, kind of a different vibe. Um, uh, okay. So go ahead, KP. What is your favorite country to travel to? One minute. <laughs> uh, so most of the countries I've traveled to has been for, actually every country I've traveled to has been either to play basketball or for an all Exclusive, inclusive, not all exclusive, all exclusive resort where I stood outside and they did things and I couldn't know, inclusive resort. So I feel like um, though I've traveled to a ton of places, I probably haven't gotten to experience kind of the real experience that most people get in countries. Um, Greece is beautiful. Shanghai, they treat tall basketball players like they're gods. Um, that's not a country though, so I should say China if I want to be good. Um, Costa Rica, probably my favorite that I've been to. Um, 
but I like traveling to a lot of cities throughout the United States. I think um, being a citizen here, the United States has a ton of great cities and a lot of different places to visit. And I'm running out of time, so I got to stop talking. But my answer <laughs> is like five places. Sorry. Okay. okay. <laughs> Uh oh, we got an echo. Echo, echo. I don't hear an echo. Okay, I heard it for a second. It's gone now. All right, my favorite country to travel to would be any country that I haven't been to before. Um, unfortunately, fortunately, whatever way you want to look at it, I haven't, I haven't traveled as much as I would have loved to. So I, I. I really can't say that like there's one country that I want to go back to because I always am kind of looking forward in terms of where I want to go, where I haven't been yet before. Um, as far as where I've been to that is my favorite, I, I just, I can't, I don't know. I've been there long enough that <laughs> I'm just ready for something new. So, um, but I would definitely agree with Miss Jody that the food is incredible in Vietnam. And it's such an experience. It's a, a must do. So I'll end with that. <laughs> Have you been to all the continents, Jody? Uh, I've not been to Antarctica. Okay. Um, my brother and I have a bit of a continent war, which is just a petty sibling rivalry. And I offered, why don't we go to Antarctica together? It'll be like a wonderful trip. We'll have sibling bonding. And he was like, no way. I'm going to beat you there. <laughs> <laughs> Forget about it. I invited him to Asia too. He came with me to see the Tars years in the Philippines. And yet that was his Asian extravaganza. That's how he got that continent. <laughs> really? I actually, yeah. I don't, um, I don't actually really count countries either. People ask me a lot uh, how many countries I've been to. And I do find it's more of a question that Americans ask than Canadians or elsewhere. Um, but I, I don't really count. I think I like going back to places to eat. So I just keep going where I want to eat. <laughs> now she's speaking my language. I understand that. <laughs> That's right. That's all I care about. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thanks to everyone for your questions on Audience Ask. Um, as you can see, we still have some fun ones here on the left, and we will definitely be getting to those. As we kind of jump in our discussion here, if you do have questions for Jody. Please make sure that you put them in the chat box and we will respond to them, kind of wrap them right into the show. In addition, we will be opening up the, um, the little box. Uh, my brain just completely went at nine o'clock. And so you can actually chat with Jody one on one if you'd like to about food or ask her about travel or any of the conversation that we're talking about. Um, so let's go ahead and jump in. First of all, I, I again just want to say thank you so much, Jody, for taking the time. Like, I have been an uh, admirer of your writing, especially um, since we met in Vietnam, kind of since we both, you know, come to know some of the similar people, and I've been able to follow you online. Folks, if you're not following Jody on Instagram, you absolutely want to. She tells uh, a beautiful you. photo with or a beautiful uh, story with every photo. Um, in addition, her writing on her blog is, is it's excellent. Um, and I, I don't say that lightly. So, thank um, you. no, thank you. Uh, thanks for coming. So the thing with, with Miss Jody is that she's got this incredibly diverse background. So when we spoke on the phone about coming on the show, it was like, what are, what are we going to talk about? Because there is so much to talk about. Um, I think that the thing that, that resonates the most with me about you specifically is just how connected you are to what it is that you do, how much you love it. And I feel like that really comes through in your writing. But I'd like to kind of introduce your story to everyone who's here tonight and just talk about your background before we actually kind of talk about what it is that you're doing right now. So tell us a little bit about, uh, and in your bio, you know, you were a lawyer for 15 years, remember? <laughs> for five yeah. years. Five years. Um, <laughs> and this was in New York. So, so talk to us about where you were at five, you know, that, that time ago in your law, why it was you decided to jump out of that. 
So I think when people hear sort of the soundbite story, like the one that you you know introduced me as, and that's the, the most common introduction, is that small bio. Um, there's sort of this story that everyone assumes, which is like, I was a lawyer, I burnt out, and then I set out to travel around the world um, as a result. Uh, but what actually happened is that I went to McGill for law school, and I went quite young. Um, someone actually bet me I couldn't get into law school the day that I uh, that applications were due. So what I, I ended up doing is not going to undergraduate degree. Uh, I skipped it because they took like a few of us who were quite young and shoved us in with everyone else. And so I started law school very young. I did the degree. I was recruited into uh, a firm in New York City. And I figured, you know what? I never wanted to be a lawyer. It was not something my parents pressured me to do. It was purely like almost just the stubbornness of the silly bet. Um, and since tuition in Canada is quite reasonable compared to Americans, my tuition was about 1600 uh, per semester Canadian at a time when the Canadian dollar was quite weak. And I always mention that because it's relevant to what I'm doing now. I didn't have the school debt um, that I think a lot of Americans end up with. Uh, when I when I went to New York, I had always wanted to travel and I had always wanted to see Siberia specifically. I had watched a, a Trans-Siberian Trains documentary when I was in high school and I decided like, okay, I really want to go here. I want to see this in person. And then as I started working those 90 hour weeks uh, in corporate law, uh, I thought, you know what, maybe I should take a year and take a sabbatical and travel around the world and then come back to New York as a lawyer and do work that is more uh, sustainable, more public advocacy work or work for a nonprofit instead of a private law firm. So when I set out in 2008, the goal was actually just take a year, uh, sort of travel, see the places I had really wanted to see. And so Siberia was, you know, on that list and then come back to New York again and work some in some capacity as a lawyer. Um, obviously, it's been almost eight years. April 1st will be eight years. So uh, that never happened. I'm still, <laughs> I did not go back to being a lawyer. But what did happen is I started this blog mostly for my mom so that she could see where I was going and what I was doing and sort of feel like she was a part of it. She's a big storyteller. You know, her love of understanding places, understanding the people in places is something that I think I really took when I, you know, grew up and she would tell us stories. So I started it for her and over the years it really grew um, and I decided to keep it ad free. I wanted it to be a place that I would sort of stand as a CV on its own, you know, for when, forever how long I wanted to keep it. Um, so I didn't take sponsored posts, I didn't take advertising and I wrote the way I wanted to read, which, which is really long <laughs> posts. <laughs> and um, I realized that that's not for everyone, but my posts are anywhere from, you know, two to 10,000 words. Uh, so. I just basically kept doing that over the years. The site grew. Uh, the things that I became passionate about along the way, food, um, advocating for people with the same disease and trying to understand how to travel safely, because it is really scary, as you know, when you go to a place and you just don't know what will get you sick for days. Um, and talking a lot about storytelling and how storytelling is you know, this really amazing tool to connect people in different places and help you understand you know, places that you might never even get to. So you you um you started your blog because you kind of wanted to keep your mom updated. So so what was like um what was kind of the I guess the the motivation you know behind like at at what point in time did it become something that you realized you really enjoyed doing and you wanted to start you know putting a lot of time and energy into it? Where, when did that happen? I think, you know, I've always written, I, I did an interview once um, and I said in a, I would be writing if no one was reading, you know, it's something I've always done. I wrote for myself, I wrote for my mom and then to my surprise, other people seem to want to read it too. Like I just wrote for what I saw and cared about and the fact that it, it started to build into a business was not, was a surprise to me also, you know, but um, I basically, in 2010, was asked um, by CNN in Asia if I would be interested in being a stringer for them. So basically being a freelance writer, doing some work for them. And they had asked me to sign a year contract. They found my blog while I was in Bangkok. And that was really the first time that I stopped and said, like, wait a minute, people would pay me to do this? You know, this is, this is not what I thought I was doing. And while freelance writing is not a big part of what I do now, it's what kind of set it off in this idea that you know, maybe, maybe this is more than simply a trip and then I go back. And so I said, you know, if I'm not making a certain amount of money after two years time, you know, then I'm going to go back and I'll become a lawyer again. And it, 
until then, I'm going to just try and see where it goes. And that's sort of what happened. I set that timeline for myself, and the site just grew in the interim, and you know, press covered the site as it went. Um, and I think you know, someone in the comments had said, you know, two to ten thousand words, like that's crazy. And it's true, but I do think it set the site apart. You know, people were able to see it as slightly different than you know, sites that were doing things like you know, sound bites. And I realized that those are popular too, um, but. I try to tell a story in the things that I write and put it together in a way that makes people hopefully think differently about the things that they're reading. And if they think differently about the things they're reading, maybe they're learning about a place or people and maybe they're opening their minds a little and that's really the ultimate goal. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I think that, you know, obviously some some people are gonna enjoy the smaller sound bites. Other people are really going to enjoy just kind of sitting down and immersing themselves you know, in a blog or an article that's really going to touch on several points. Um, that's what social is for too, right? Like people yeah. who don't want to read, that's fine. I have, you know, I, I post to Instagram pretty regularly. Those are shorter captions. I know they're still long for Instagram sometimes, but they're shorter captions. They're photos. They're showing where I am. I don't use Instagram, Instagram as a portfolio. Uh, I do sometimes post like archives, but it's generally, you know, here's where I am right now. Right now I'm in Mexico. I'm showing photos from what I'm eating, what I'm seeing. I'm trying to explain it. So if you don't want to read, you know, 6,000 words on the history of chili peppers, you can take a look at my Instagram instead. There's something for everyone. <laughs> so where did, where did, uh, where did your, I, I've always loved to write too. And I feel like I've had a, I've had a journal since I was seven. I have mm -hmm. like boxes of journals that I have some weird idea that like I'll die one day and someone will want to read them or something. Um, so I've always loved to write as well. But what about you? Like, where did your love of writing come from? I don't know. I mean, I never, I always read uh, as a kid. You know, I never really uh, spent time thinking of being a writer. I didn't intend to, you know, lawyers do write, but contracts are not the same as uh, writing the kind of stuff we're, we're talking about. I, I don't, <laughs> I think it's just always been in my blood. You know, my, my, my dad, and my mom always told stories. I think writing is one way to convey them. For some people, it's video. For others, it's photography. You know, I've tried really hard to get better at my photos. My photos were terrible uh, at the beginning. And now, you know, I still shoot in auto. I always joke about that. They're like the plate to carry my words. But I think it's really important to have a visual aspect that really matters and that is still with some judiciousness. You know, you take your time. You try and get better at it. So, you know, even, even if you're not the world's best writer, the world's best photographer, I think taking the time to try and get better at it makes you care about it more and that, that makes you better at what you do. Absolutely. I mean, personally, I think that that's something that I've always like really admired personally about your writing and about your photography is that it is very, uh, uh, it's very personalized. It's very, uh, it's very clear. It's very succinct. Um, I think with like within your writing, it's it's just something that welcomes everybody, but always kind of adds a little bit of, uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm completely missing my words right now. So <laughs> what when was it that you shifted from writing for CNN and doing kind of these things to to food? Where where did that that happen? Yeah, so I actually didn't really write much about food at the beginning, and I didn't really care about food much for most of my life. Um, I grew up eating like everyone else did and you know, enjoying food, but not really thinking about it as I do now. It wasn't until I really started traveling that um, I started to care more. Sorry, muting. Yeah. Um, <laughs> because I, I saw just how food was this connective tissue between places and people in ways that, you know, let me understand more than anything else. I definitely, you know, you, anyone can pick a passion that, that is prevalent in the world. You know, there are people who are surfers who write about surfing and who travel the world surfing um, on the world's best beaches. And, you know, it, they get to understand a place through that. For me, food was the most wide and intensive ones that I could find that is everywhere. It's so universal. You know, these traditions exist so much. I, I'm from Canada. My food traditions in my country are very young, right? You go to places where it's like thousands of years of this way of eating and preparing a food and thinking about food. It's so different and, and it's so important. You know, in Vietnam, I always loved how there's an expression, instead of saying in English, we say he has a good soul. 
And in Vietnam, the expression directly translates to he has a good stomach. Like that's how important food is there because it's really the fabric of society, of community. And as I started traveling, it became more important to me. I still didn't write about it until my friend Jared, uh, who actually spoke with today, I met up with him in Kuala Lumpur. We've been friends for a long time. And I was like, Jared, we need to go to this town called Malacca and we have to go to this one restaurant and we have to order the number two soup. And he was like, we're not taking a bus to another town to try a bowl of soup just because. And I was like, no, of course we are. That's exactly what we're going to be doing. I met a guy <laughs> in a and he told me I have to go. We have to go. And he was like, you need to write about food. And, and I was like, well, everyone cares this much. And he was like, no, <laughs> no, they don't. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's when I really decided that it would be something I wrote more about. And I think it's been fun because I always say, you know, I'm not an expert. I di I'm not a chef. I didn't go to culinary school. I didn't study, you know, food history. I'm learning with my readers and I love asking them questions. They connect me with people. You know, one of my readers is an economist and he was like, oh, I know the guy who wrote the book about chili peppers in America. It's like the most seminal chili pepper book. Let me ask him this question that you were asking. You know, I love learning along with everyone. I think the beauty of blogs versus, you know, academic text or that kind of, you know, broadcasting only is that you learn with people. It's it's very immersive and it's very, you know, connective. And, and so I decided midway through that food was important and, uh, and happily my readers came along with me. <laughs> what year was that? Probably 2010 also. 2008 okay. and nine is when I is when I started writing a little about it, but it wasn't till I got to Asia specifically um, and Thailand and started stuffing my face with all delicious food. <laughs> where I was like, oh, oh, this is this is great. <laughs> <laughs> so we had a we had a great question come in from Shannon, um, and uh, maybe uh, Shannon you didn't hear it in the bio. Jody has written a book. It's called The Food Travelers. Handbook. So, at what point in time did the Food Traveler's Handbook come into play, and what was kind of the reasoning behind writing this? I think it's very similar to what I just described. My readers were asking me, you know, how do you eat all this food without constantly getting sick? How is it that we can experience culture like you without being afraid of doing so? Uh, getting, you know, they're like, how do we not die of dysentery doing what you do? <laughs> And I also wanted the book to talk about why food's important. Specifically, it's about cheap food, you know, street food, and and how that's not just about eating these amazing flavors that are different than what we're used to, but also about the the really incredible experience of sitting on the side of the street and like sitting and watching everything. The families that come, the way that the stalls set up and get taken down, you know, the 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 questions like where do they pay rent? Where does their water come from? There's so much that goes into you know this day to day experience that is so different. I know street food's really trendy at home, but it's it was born out of necessity, you know, where it originated. And and I think that experience really really adds a layer to people's travels uh, that's totally different from from just going and like checking off places on a list, you know. So what does what does the handbook cover? Like, what does it really? It basically talks involve? about how to how to eat cheap food safely around the world. Um, it, it talks about why food matters, but it's basically the tips on choosing street food stalls that won't get you sick. Uh, all sorts of resources about etiquette, like table manners and different things in different countries. And it, of course, it has a chapter on eating restrictions. Um, as a celiac, wanted to make sure that people could feel like they had some tools in their hands um, to go out and travel a little more adventurously without being as ex anxious because it is, as we've said, you know, a scary thing. Uh, and it takes research, but there are also some interesting sites out there. And I hoped that the book would provide some case studies and, and insight as well for people to travel with celiac disease. Nice. When, did the, when was the book published? Published at the end of 2012. Okay, awesome. Mm -hmm. So let's let's talk about your celiacs a little bit, um, since you just touched on that. When when were you diagnosed? Uh, I'm a celiac? The question of procrastination on the side there. Um, I was <laughs> diagnosed in 2001, at, and the landscape has really really changed. Um, it's obviously something that more people are diagnosing now. When I was um, originally diagnosed, there really wasn't much out there. You know, I'm a member of celiac associations and. It's always interesting to see people who are immediately diagnosed. They they want to they ask people basically how can I eat exactly the same diet, but gluten free? And I think that's a mistake in terms of like your own mental state too. It's really 
though I think it's a really interesting opportunity to try and learn about other cooking and cultures that don't use wheat as a matter of course. There's like so many flavorful spices and sauces and stuff that don't have wheat. Instead of like building your gluten-free sub, you know, go out yeah. and learn how to cook something that's Indian or, you know, different food. And so that's what I had to do. Basically, it didn't, um, to answer the question, what got me into it was being diagnosed. And that was before there was a whole market for gluten-free eats. Um, so I basically learned how to cook, but I also learned the building blocks of flavor of food and how different flavors fit together. And I think that's definitely been a really important foundation to my writing about food because it's something, you know, that I really had to pay attention to at home and, and abroad. Yeah. People, you know, when, when, uh, when I tell people that I'm a celiac, they're like, Oh, I'm very sorry for you. And those sorts of things. <laughs> So and and yeah, it's it's you know I can't I can't eat pizza like KP all the time, which is really to me like the biggest travesty. Not that I ate pizza God, all the time before. That's I, yeah. Anyway, but um, you know, like you're saying, I think that it it completely opens up these avenues. Like I've become such a healthy eater mm -hmm. because of becoming a celiac. I've my my cooking game has you know has, has gone grown out. monumentally. Um, I've always loved really ethnic foods and certainly preferred them over American foods. But um, I think the biggest thing is I'm just so thankful that I wasn't diagnosed like way back when. Like I can't even yeah. imagine being diagnosed as a celiac in 2001. Like, get there's, off my lawn. No. Uh, there's so many, like there's so many products now and, and you know, it, it's, it's so much more not just not just in terms of what you can buy, but when you actually walk into a restaurant, right? And you're yeah, like, hey, that's the I'm hard a part, celiac. For sure. You know, and, and can I talk to the chef? And people are actually more understanding about it now than I can't even imagine back in 2005, you know? I disagree. I think it's the opposite. I have way more trouble now than I used to. Um, it used to be that people took me seriously, and now they don't in restaurants. You know, when the diet... The because gluten -free people are on a gluten-free diet, and they're and they're like, oh, I can't eat, uh, see, I can't eat any wheat. But then I'm gonna have the chocolate cake for dessert just because I feel like cheating. You know, that screws you and me over in the end. I think, you know, I I always say I respect anyone's choices. Wheat is inflammatory. You know, the studies do show it does affect your joints, which is why celiacs have a specifically hard time, you know, with other inflammatory foods like capsicums or other things that are, you know, nightshades. There, there's plenty of reasons to avoid wheat if you want. I don't think that everyone should cut it out necessarily, but I'm also not a doctor. My point is, I do think that everyone should do what they're comfortable with, but do not pretend that you have the disease when you don't. That's what's making it difficult for celiacs because people are going into restaurants and they're pretending and then they're not, the chef is taking it less seriously. You know, I went to New Zealand, which is a country that everyone's like, oh, it's great, you should go. Everyone cares about celiacs there. And what happened is, you know, I ended up getting, they're like, we're putting the gluten-free pizza in a separate pan and everything. There you go, KP, I had pizza. And they ended up putting mayo on it. And what I didn't realize was that in New Zealand, mayonnaise has wheat in it. And they use it to thicken the mayo, which, you know, we don't in North America. And so I got really sick. But it, it's a really, you know, he was like, oh, well, I just didn't think it mattered. It wasn't very much. It's, it's that kind of attitude that wouldn't have happened you know, many years ago. But that yeah. said, there are many, many more options now for creating meals than were there before. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, we have a question here. Did you ever think so about becoming contentious, vegan? Contentious question. No, I'm, it's not something I want to do. I, I was a lot of meat <laughs> for a few years um, and I ended up bringing meat back into my diet when I uh, was diagnosed because I was severely anemic and I was recommended to do so. Um, but being vegan is not something that I am looking to do. But I, I realize there are many people who are food and travel is so important and understanding the culture often involves eating meat. And I do limit the kinds of meat I eat based on you know, how animals are raised. I got into a big Instagram kerfuffle the other day because I posted a photo of a chicken in a plastic bag in the back of a trunk. And like, let me tell you, it was the most beautiful chicken. He was just like popping out. And um, the guy who owned him was in the back of the cab, this toothless old man. And he was just kind of like waving at me, like, look at my chicken. Uh, and someone got very upset in the comments. And I was like, look, this is my day-to-day -day experience. You know, I'm currently in Mexico. This, this chicken has a much better life than the chickens do in North America that grew up, you know, stuffed in a barn somewhere. 
But no joke. for me, you know, I, being a part of the food culture means also eating what people eat, and that often means meat. I don't eat um, certain things. You know, everyone's got their, got their limits, but uh, vegan is not yet on my my food list. We have an echo. Uh -oh. I don't hear an echo. Okay, one more question here from David. Do you like spicy food? How do you order on a scale from one to five? <laughs> uh, I think that one to five changes depending on where you are. If yeah, you, no joke. <laughs> one to five, like a five Thai spicy is like a 95 <sighs> anywhere else. That's right. Is Please make me fall asleep under the table. Um, I do like spicy food. I think it does take practice, though. Like the, the time I spent in Vietnam, there's not as much spicy food. I had sort of built up my tolerance after Thailand and India. And then in Vietnam, you know, it's a lot of, of savory and very neutral, balanced food. So um, I think yeah, I would need to practice again uh, so I wouldn't have tears pouring down my face. But I still eat it, even though tears pour down my face. <laughs> You're one of those. I know. Like it's, it's so good. <laughs> it's when I lived, uh, when I lived in Jackson, there was there was a, a a Thai place, and we would go in, and it was like just these three ladies. It was amazing, and they didn't speak any English, and so you wrote down what you wanted, and then how many stars for the the heat. And I can handle spicy food, and so I would get like two. And my roommate would get the five and she would sweat and cry. I mean, like the whole time. And I'm just like, how is this enjoyable? <laughs> I just don't understand. I don't, uh, I don't get that very much. Anyway, so, okay. So in terms of traveling, because you're on the road a lot, um, you now are, you know, constantly kind of picking up your home space very often, how, what, what is it like living, living out of a bag, living on yeah. the road, <laughs> well, going from place to place? Clothes are small also, which makes it a little easier than someone like KP who clothes are bigger, <laughs> he's like giant, <laughs> giant trousers. Um, I think, yeah, it, you know, you get used to it. I definitely, um, I don't want to be wasteful, right? But I do think that, um, that there are the, the opportunity cost to deciding to live this kind of life where I don't have a set base all the time, you know, that it's important to go and, and try and take what's minimally necessary. And then worst case, you need to get something. So like, you know, I have a bag with me and then I'm, I have an opportunity to speak at a conference or something where I need something dressier. Uh, thankfully the clothes fit me in Asia and here in Mexico. Um, there are ways to get around it, but I do think, you know, it's not as difficult as everyone says. You don't need as much stuff as you believe you do. Um, and for me as a lawyer, you know, when I was saving up money to travel, I wasn't buying tons of stuff either because I really wanted to travel the world and I didn't want to just aggregate. But even the, the less stuff that I had compared to, let's say my friends, I still had so much more than I think I needed. Um, and I'm not a hyper minimalist. I don't travel carry on only. Um, I, I like to look what I hope is respectable. But I think there, there's a comfort level where you know you realize that if you want to explore a new place, you can do so. You don't have to take you know 25 days to go and get your life in order. It, it doesn't take as much. But um, I think it's really hard to get into that place when you're not in it. You know, Even when I go and spend a lot of time in North America, I think, oh, well, it is easy to buy things. It's something that is so inherently built into the culture. And I do think it's unfortunate. There's a lot of, you know, upmanship on the internet. You, I'm a minimalist and you are a terrible person for not owning as few things as I do, you know, or the opposite. You, how dare you live this unconventional life? It, you know, someone in the comments said everything in moderation. I think that's really true when it comes to this also. You know, you, there are levels that people feel comfortable living this kind of life or doing something unconventional. For me, I, I'm not trying to prove anything. This is just what happened and the life that I have is something that came to be bit by bit and I just decided to follow it and to follow the things that I was interested in um, and in the process I didn't you know aggregate a house and furniture but that's not to say that one day I may change my mind it's just everyone needs to make those decisions personally it's the same with 
you know, eating meat or not eating meat. <laughs> but I think it's really uh, important to remember that our North American society, especially, really focuses on consumption in a way that, you know, isn't as necessary as as we believe. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. So what do you what do you think is kind of, you know, in the mind, what is different in the mindset of someone who really is okay kind of picking up and moving constantly and then someone who actually is, you know, maybe not. Um, and obviously that's not you, so no need to go there as much. But <laughs> you and I have both traveled a lot. We're both around a lot of travelers pretty consistently. So what, what kind of things do you see in, in people who really love to travel? I mean, I think you are good at it, I should say. I think that the most important thing is a curiosity, right? A, a sense of wonder about all the little things in life. And someone on a travel forum the other day had said, like, I'm building my bucket list post. What are the off the beaten path places that you've been to? And I was just like, ah, you know, it doesn't it doesn't need to be off the beaten path. You can have an amazing, intensive experience anywhere at home or somewhere exciting. And if you're not open in your mind and curious and trying to really learn as much as you can, then, you know, that itself is, is not going to affect you as much as it could. So I think the people who I've met who are longer term travelers, you know, they've figured out what works for them when they're tired, they stay places a little longer, but they're, they're really curious and they're trying to learn as much as they can. And this happens to be the life that they've been able to build. That's a little unconventional that allows them to do that. Absolutely. So in terms of being a woman and a woman who's on the road a lot, <laughs> let's talk about that a little bit. <laughs> um, you and I have both had discussions about the things that, that we've had to, you know, kind of give up to be on the road or to be more mobile. Um, mm -hmm. what, are, what are some of the things that, you know, that you've said no to in order to have this lifestyle? Um, well, I think you know, saying no to what, people think is the life you're supposed to have. It, it's, it's hard to have a discussion about it um, with people because people get very defensive sometimes, not just people back in North America, but travelers too, you know, to have, everyone's very cognizant of their decisions and not wanting to feel like they made the wrong decision, I think. And so it's a sensitive thing, but, you know, you, if, you've, if you decide to live a life like I do, which is pretty transient and granted I have friends around the world and, you know, we try and cross paths again friends here in uh, Mexico where I am, you know, people that I've met in 2010, 2011, that we made it the plan together to come and spend time here because we wanted to hang out. And they also have an unconventional life that allows them to do that. But it's giving up the consistency, you know, not just being a lawyer and having a fixed salary, but also the consistency of relationships, of day-to-day -day community, of that kind of, the, there's a new anxiety when you're not really sure where you're going to be heading next. And that's something I've chosen and doing it still like overcomes the desire I have to not do it anymore. But I think it's not for everyone for that reason. And um, there are people you meet that are similar to you. You know, I, I dated someone for two years who's also someone who has an unconventional life. And, and it was really fun and interesting to be with someone who, you know, had the same mentality that I did about travel and, and living. So I think, you know, what I do say, what people do say often is like, don't you want to settle down? Don't you want to meet someone? So you should stop traveling so you could do that. And I'm always like, well, I could stop traveling and then meet someone who doesn't understand why I just traveled for eight years. Like that doesn't seem, it's not like my friends back in New York are having the greatest dating life either. You know, <laughs> some of them are having a lot of trouble. <laughs> to me, it was like, I'm going to do what I love in life and I'm going to build something around it, I hope. And if I cross paths with someone who jives with me, like I did, you know, just before when, when I dated this, this guy, um, then it would be a wonderful opportunity to see how our lives meld. But I'm not going to stop doing this because, you know, I care about it too much. And, and it's been a really adventurous way to live and certainly not what I expected to be doing. Um, but I think it really depends on what you want out of life. And, and this was the choice I made. Yeah, no doubt. So what do you, what do you think that the, the hardest thing to give up has been? Um, or maybe like the hardest thing to to kind of stay away from? I think the hardest thing for me, you know, coming from a lockstep profession um, like the law was the the sort of certainty of salary. But that's just, that's not necessarily what I'm doing now, right? Like that, that could have been just leaving the law to do something more entrepreneurial um, instead. Um, you know, someone's asking, do I contact my friends when I made when I traveled? 
um, that I made on my travels. Like David Lee, who just joined the group, is someone I met in 2009, actually during karaoke, um, <laughs> a karaoke <laughs> extravaganza. You know, and he's here in Oaxaca too, along with a few other friends, my friend Shannon. They're a big group of us. And the reason we all came is we said, like, let's go eat together for a few months or however long anyone could spare. And so it, if you want to, oh no, if you want to uh, go and make those plans together and try and make sure that you have a community, you can, it's, it's doable. Um, I think people sometimes have this idea that like they're doing this by themselves and if they change their plans for someone else, then they're, they're not really allowing themselves to live their free lives. And I think that's just untrue. You know, what matters most in the world is, is that kind of connective um, friendship or relationships or whatever you have it, it's a beautiful thing to change things around um, and build a community. And that's something I'm really grateful that I've been able to do. Yeah, absolutely. So what do you think has been like the, the greatest part about having your, your life on the road? I do think it's, um, it's the ability to have built a business around learning as much as I can. That was something I felt like I really missed when I was a lawyer. You know, I did enjoy the work in that it was like an intellectual challenge. And, you know, I, my clients still read my blog, which I'm really <laughs> like, I can't have been a terrible lawyer, at least if they still read my blog. Um, but it wasn't like the kind of thing that made me wake up in the morning and be like, I can't wait to do this. The fact that, you know, I'm running around town, stuffing my face with food and talking to people about their recipes and learning about, you know, where corn came from and where chili peppers come from, that that's work is a really awesome thing. And you know, who knows where it goes. I don't know that I want to do this forever. Of course, it's a long, that's a long time. But for now, just the ability to go out and have, you know, a place that's new to eat in and really enjoy, um, I think, I think it's a wonderful thing. So let's talk a little bit about kind of what your direction is, because you've got a lot of really awesome things coming that you're working on and kind of coming, coming up. So um, <laughs> we'll just ignore that. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> I, was about to say. I take a teaspoon a day too because it's really good for my stomach, but I can't say it's helped me in that yeah. sense. No joke. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what it is? What is it? Excuse me, that you're working on right now? You've got uh, first of all, tell the folks about your shirts um, that you've been working on. <laughs> I'm fine. It's good. We're all good. Everyone's happy. Um, yeah, sure. So what basically, um, like I said, I don't actually, um, I don't take sponsored posts. I don't take ads. And what I wanted to do was like try and build stuff that my readers would find useful and, um, and that they would feel excited about. So the first things I wanted to sell them were things that I created. To, that was my book. That was in 2012. And a few years later, I really wanted to basically buy a friend a map of um, Vietnam, the, the shape of the country, and then all the foods around it. And she, she loves Vietnamese food as much as I do. And unlike me, she has a home. So I thought that would be a great idea, except it didn't exist. And so I basically decided to build a shop where I would do 10 countries in all. And I started with Vietnam. Um, and then I've done Thailand and Mexico. And the next one is Portugal. And they're basically hand-drawn maps of food. They're one of a kind. And it's like the shape of the country and typographically written the names of the foods around them. So those are done in posters. And they're in t-shirts. And they're going to be in tote bags and mugs as well. And it's really great because it's stuff. I love how they look. They're so pretty. They don't exist. Like It was a new thing that was done um, and a fun way to have people yeah, experience food uh, without necessarily eating it, <laughs> but just being able to appreciate the kinds of fun dishes that are out there in different countries. And I know that the, especially the Viet the Vietnam ones have been a big hit. How are the others doing? Yeah, they're well. I mean, people do love food, and they they're in black and in white the posters, and they're very stark. You know, they look different. I have a friend. Who, um, who went to Austin and sent me a photo in a Vietnamese restaurant there, had bought the poster and it's on their wall at the restaurant. You know, it's more restaurants have been buying them, which is really cool, <laughs> unexpected. And um, I've seen people wearing them, you know, as I've traveled the shirts, which is also extremely exciting. And I love how they turned out. So people seem to like them, there'll be 10 in all. And, um, and yeah, it was a really exciting way to add an e-commerce component to what I was doing. So I had to learn about Shopify and learn about 
uh, building an e-commerce store, but it's, it's interesting and I'm glad that I've had a chance to do it. Nice. So talk to us about your, your gluten cards that you're working on right now um, for celiacs. So I don't know, have you used, like when you've traveled, have you been using gluten-free cards as you've traveled? Well, I, I Vietnam, Vietnam was the last place I was out of the U.S. anyways. So no, <laughs> easy, easy answer. Um, I did find the uh, uh, Celiac's Bible when I got back to the U.S. that would have offered a lot more, like better cards for traveling, but no, not beforehand. Um, so the reason, this is what I started doing, and um, I know someone's asking, uh, David, what we're, what we're talking about is um, when celiacs or other people with allergies travel, they often have translation cards um, that have in the local language, like the things that you're allergic to or can't eat. So for people with nut allergies, it'll say, I, I'll get very sick, go into anaphylactic shock and may die. Um, thankfully, celiac's disease is not as aggressive. <laughs> Uh, or scary in that sense, but but it does harm you for years uh, when you do eat gluten. And so I, I've used the translation cards that are out there and I'm very grateful that they exist um, because they are a great precedent for what I'm doing. But essentially I still got sick because a lot of developing countries don't really know what has wheat in it. So the cards will say, I, I can't eat wheat, barley and rye, but I took them for example to Japan and no one really knew what had wheat in it. They didn't realize soy sauce, for example, had wheat flour in it. Um, right. And so what I decided to do is build translation cards that were super detailed with the names of all the foods in the countries that you can't eat and then have a, on the flip side a list of foods that are likely to be safe and likely to be unsafe. So I've done Japan and I actually have a, a post on my site with the photo of the card that people um, can download for free. And I'm in the process of building this big database of, um, of different cards for, for all these different countries. My readers who have mother tongues that are not English are helping me translate them. And basically like the goal is eventually have people be able to go out and have more confidence and, and know that these cards are really, really detailed and they're not just out there uh, with, with, with you know the basics. It'll really give you a list of all the foods that you can and can't eat um, as you travel. How many, how many countries are you opting to are you going to try and cover as many as we can really i mean i've got a database of 30 right now um that yes. we're building i'm starting with basically i started a, a group for celiacs who travel on facebook and um i asked them what they what their needs were first because i wanted to try and fulfill that i did japan we're doing um italy spain china thailand vietnam uh, i think are in the works now and are being sent out to trend for translation um, and then the next ones, I have a whole chart of readers who volunteered to help translate, which is really amazing. It's, it's been a really fun project and obviously something that, you know, we both feel is necessary, but also that we understand the panic. So it's something that I think, you know, the world needs, it's, it's not done yet. <laughs> when are, when are like, kind of what's the, the time frame on them? Um, I'm going to be rolling them out one by one, um, as I go. So Japan's done and Greece is done. And those mm -hmm. are both on the site, on that gluten-free page that um, KP shared earlier. The links to the blog posts for each of those are there. Um, then the next one should be either Vietnam or um, Portugal. And then basically bit by bit, I'll, I'll have them. I'm going to put them into an app after because it would be great to just have them in one place that people can have on their phone and an app that's available offline also so people don't have to you know, worry about downloading it. They can download it on Wi-Fi and then have it available to them on, offline to just show people. And the cards are, you know, trying to be as respectful as possible to the local culture. So for in Japan where, you know, being a master of food is such, it takes so much training and it takes so much time. You know, it, it says, I'm really sorry. I'm so sorry that we're screwing with your meal that you've created for us. I just want, um, I don't want to be rude, but I do want to have people feel like they understand the severity of it um, without being too culturally insensitive, you know? Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. Because it's, <laughs> I mean, I think even in the U.S., you know, if you go to a, a, a any kind of restaurant, you know, depending upon who's who's in the kitchen, yeah, they might be irritated if you're going to ask for something to not be in the food or be in the food. Um, so we had a question here uh, quickly from Shannon about where your T-shirts are manufactured. So they're actually print on demand uh, so that I don't have to stock inventory. I use a company called The Printful, 
and uh, they're based in California and they ship out um, when people order, they have the prints, you know, in their stock and they can print out and send them out that way. And they do the posters and they do the t-shirts also. And I've actually been really happy with them. Um, their customer service has been great. They have not screwed much up, but once they sent out, someone ordered uh, two maps to Pakistan through the military. Like they were, they were sent there via military. And so it took forever to get there and they got there and it was, instead of being Thailand and Vietnam maps, they were to Vietnam. And she's like, I really love Vietnam, but this is not what I ordered. And they were really great. They were like, that's our mistake. They printed a new one, shipped it off, no charge to me. So I've been quite happy with them um, for their, their customer service. They're very nice. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. Good to know. <laughs> okay, as we are kind of wrapping things up here, um, Jody, where where can people get a hold of you? What are the best ways for them to connect with you? Uh, you can reach me on my website, which KP has uh, graciously been linking to. It's legalnomads.com and on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram also as Legal Nomads. I kept it simple. Uh, seemed like the best way to go. Um, and yeah, Definitely I, follow her on Instagram. <laughs> thank you very much. My Twitter feed is not uh, the same as everything else. I tend to tweet long form news articles and astronomy and science and uh, it's different than travel and it's always been that way um, and my newsletter is that kind of stuff too um, but my blog is about travel and food and Instagram shows basically photos of the same wherever I happen to be. It's not it's not a an Instagram account you want to follow if you're like on a diet or like taking a break <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> Definitely not at all. Funny. All right. All right. Well, folks, thanks so much for joining us this week. Thanks again, Jody, for coming. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. I love having you on the show. <laughs> for everyone who's here, make sure you hang out. We're going to take questions. We'll open up the seat at 9, so don't go anywhere. Um, make sure you join us. Next week, we are going to have Johnny FD on the show. He's going to be talking about his life travel as a boss like a boss uh, he's got a podcast he has created a lifestyle where he lives abroad um, he's currently located in Thailand he is constantly putting out blogs kind of comparing his lifestyle to the American lifestyle a lot of things that Jody actually touched on we were talking just kind of about the uh, the way that we collect things in the US versus when you're abroad so make sure you tune into that that's gonna be 8 p.m next week as well eastern so thanks again to our guests thanks again to everyone who has come participated in the show and been with us we thank you so much <laughs>